director of Lone Star College System, the largest institution of higher education in the Houston area, which consists of six colleges, eight centers, and two university centers. Lone Star System is a publicly supported two-year comprehensive community college system, involves diverse individuals, businesses, and the community and quality education opportunities for the successful development of knowledge, skills, and attitudes for, rapid, for a rapidly changing world. The college is an open enrollment institution that accepts all students once their admission application has been submitted. Dr. Head was appointed as the fourth chancellor in the Lone Star history in June 2014. At the time he became chancellor, Dr. Head was no stranger to Lone Star, having spent the previous 30 years with the college in different positions, including president of Lone Star North Harris, executive vice chancellor, interim president, uh, at Lone Star Montgomery and President of Lone Star Keywood. As one Lone Star trustee commented at the time of his appointment, quote, he's had every job in the college system, he just knows everything there is to know. <laughs> Lone Star had about six to 7,000 students when Dr. Head started to work there. As of last fall, the enrollment was just under 84,000. So it's, it's grown enormously over that 30 year plus now. Um, Dr. Head's focus is on student access, equality, success and completion, academic quality, workforce pro programs in alignment with community needs, and collaborative agreements with educational, business, and local civic organizations. His, value, his values include operating the college on a sound, fiscally conservative model basis on data, on data efficiencies, accountability, and common sense. Dr. Head received his PhD in history from Texas Tech University and his master's and bachelor's both in history from Lamar University in Beaumont. In addition to his administrative duties at Lone Star, Dr. Head is a lecturer in the higher educational, uh, higher education doctoral program at Sam Houston University and teaches classes in community college leadership and higher education finance and has taught a number of history, undergraduate, graduate classes for the Lone Star College System and university partners. Dr. Head promotes strong community relations and partnerships with business, the government, and civic and charitable organizations. Last year, he was appointed to the Texas Economic Development Council by Texas Governor Greg Abbott. He also serves on the board of Interfaith and Woodlands, the Cypress Fairbanks Medical Center, and the American Association of Community Colleges. Additionally, he is a member of the Greater Houston Partnership, the Woodlands Economic Development Partnership, Community Colleges for International Development Executive Committee and the Sam Houston University Educational Leadership Program Advisory Council. He's a very busy man. Almost The Texas Patriots PAC has worked closely with Steve Head on, a number, on several occasions, and while we do not always agree, we know him to be an honest, open, and straight shooter, and we have utmost respect for him and what he's trying to achieve at Lone Star College. It's with great pleasure to have, to have uh, Dr. Head here together, uh, tonight. Please help me give him a warm welcome. I need to take a look and see where you're getting that information from because uh, it, uh, well, I appreciate the invitation to be here and uh, I really appreciate your comments about, just, just so you know, I travel and I tell our own employees this, how fortunate we are to live where we live, to live in the state of Texas and to live in the U.S. because we see it when we travel about uh, the difference between freedom and rights and opportunities and success. So tonight I want to talk a little bit about the role of the college and kind of where we are just so you and, and talk about some of the challenges and then I have a few specific notes that were sent to me that I'll cover. And I'd be glad to answer any questions. I, I, um, I want you to know what's going on. This is your college, and it's very important to me that you, I, I need to know what you're thinking. Whether we agree or not, I just need to know what you're thinking because it's your college. And so, and by the way, I wanted to introduce one other person here. We've, we've got a couple of two employees. Let me introduce uh, Amos McDonald, who many of you know. Amos is our new uh, vice chancellor for government relations. So everybody knows who everybody is here? Okay. That's my wife, Jen McDonald. 
And the other person that wanted to see exactly what you were doing and what I was doing and what I was saying was my wife, Linda Head, who also works at Lone Star. So uh, I, our entire life, all four of us, let me tell you how much I believe in that. She's the Associate Vice Chancellor for Workforce. So we're very much into access and for me it's about uh, educating our community because to me that's, that is the future of our country and to me that's going to propel our economy. But all four of our children went to Lone Star and they're all quite successful. Two of them went off to UT, one to Sam Houston, one is uh, went to the University of Miami and is a doctor in Houston. My son, Brian, lives <laughs> across the street from me. And then we've got a mother-in-law over here uh, who happens to work with my son who lives here in the community also. So we're invested in the community in Lone Star. Let's talk to you just in, in a broad sense, some of the what we're the overview of the college, and then uh, I'm going to talk to you about some of the challenges that we see, which I think impact everybody in this room. One, as John pointed out, we're very large. We are one of the largest community colleges in the country right now. This fall, I think uh, we'll probably add another 4,000 students, so we think we're going to be around 90,000 credit students, 90,000 and another 10,000 non-credit students. So the average community college in the state of Texas is 5,500, if that gives you any indication. So our smallest college is, is bigger than the average college in Texas. Our, we have 6,300 employees. We have 2,500 full-time and 3,800 part-time. Our operating budget next year will be about 355 million. And we have another 130 to 40 million in construction projects. And all of that is, and I'll come back and talk about the bond in just a minute, because you helped us get the bond uh, passed, and I appreciated that. But we also did that with um, a clear understanding of if the economy is not going to sustain that, then we're not going to do it. Having the money to build the buildings is one thing. Having money to run them is another. So, and I'm going to talk about where we are with oil and all that in just a minute, how it impacts us and what we're thinking about and planning. So, right now we have six colleges. We have, uh, soon we'll have 12 centers. And we're all in the North Houston metropolitan area. We actually range from, on the east side, we go from uh, Humble all the way over to Site Fair, almost to, to Katy. And on the north side, we go to Willis. And then to the south, we go all the way to Balding. So we're a very large community college system. We're looking at our growth, and those of you who know where the, you've not been on the Grand Parkway, especially if you go all the way out to Katy, and you see all that acreage out there, we know that the population is still coming to us. We're expecting to be around 120,000 students in about five years. That's just the kind of growth that we have. So I, I will tell you that the way I look at the college, we are in the business of teaching and learning. Clearly, I'm committed to that. And I've been in the system now. I'm coming up on my, as, as John mentioned, I'm coming up on my 32nd year, so I've seen us grow from 8,000 to, we're going to be 100 and whatever thousand. But we're, we're committed to the teaching and learning piece, but it is also a business, and it's a different kind of business. I understand that. We, we're not in the business like some of you are. I'm not worried about us making payroll the way you might think, but it is a business, and we have it set up on business principles. I, I just want you to understand that we think a lot. I spend more time on the budget than I do on anything else, because I know how critical it is. So we take a look at five-year projection. And uh, we're constantly looking to see where we are. And we made a commitment that we would not raise the taxes, tax rate. I want to make that really clear. We lowered the tax rate last year. Our board, I think, is financially very uh, responsive and conservative when it comes to the money piece of it. We're planning this year to lower it again. I understand the assessed value is going up. I've got, I've got that, but we're trying to get the tax uh, rate down where it makes some sense and we keep everything in balance. Kind of where we are right now is working with our board. Right now, about 38% of our money comes from taxes. 38% comes from tax If you can just keep that in your head just for a second. About 35% comes from student. So our philosophy is that students ought to pay a third of the cost, roughly. And that's been our philosophy for a long time. And here's the, here's the challenge that we're facing. It's right now the state gives us 22% of the money. And the, 
I'm not counting on the state. I just don't think the money is going to be there in future years to sustain that 22%. So what's been happening over the years, and you've probably heard this from the ISDs, they keep pushing that responsibility down to us. So we think it's going to go from 22% to 21, to 20, to 19, to 18. It's a percentage of our budget because we're going to be growing and I don't think the state money is going to keep up with it, nor am I counting on it. So we're always looking for different, how we can be more efficient and um, be responsive to taxpayers and make sure that we can explain very clearly to taxpayers exactly what's happening and what the expectations are. Well, I live here too, I'm a taxpayer too, so I'm very conscientious about assessed value going up and how much money you have, especially if you're on a fixed income. I'm, I'm, I have a few years before retirement, but I am in fact thinking about that. I'm thinking, well, if I were living here and the roof goes out and taxes keep going up and I'm not making any more money than what I was, especially if the stock market is either doing that or going flat, the, the issue with the state budget is, and I spent time in Austin, I was there last week testifying, explaining how we can help students or do credit, for example, and how the state, what I would like them to do is uh, go to a performance funding model where if you meet certain standards, then you get money instead of just giving you the money. I'm also in favor of them providing more money for workforce. If we can work with businesses and help us in the training piece of it, for me, the, the whole the part, what we're involved in is the academic piece and the workforce piece. And both of those, to me, uh, have an impact on economic development for the entire community. That's, we want our students to come here, we want them to live here, we want this to be a prosperous area. And my own personal thinking is, the better educated we are, the better off we're gonna be. That's why we have these, we have these partnerships on both ends of what we do. So we're, we work very closely with the ISDs, very closely with the ISDs. And I'm gonna talk about the development studies in just a minute, because I know that's an issue. So we also work very closely with the universities. That's why we have the University Center. So we work with uh, A&M and U of H downtown. And U of H, we work with Stephen F. Austin. And, and Brian, I didn't mention that Lamar is setting up. They, we just signed an agreement with them. We want our students, uh, my son went to the University Center. I told you know the story of my son, that he uh, and all of our children went to Lone Star, but my son went to the University Center up there. And uh, so he could stay at home. He needed to stay at home. And, uh, for the same reason that some of your children need to stay at home. I have, we have some that are really, really mature. They can go off and do their thing, and then we have some others that we need to keep tabs on for a while until they get their act together. And, uh, and he's fine now, Brian, in case you're wondering about your neighbor. He's really, he's really good. <laughs> I can't wait to get home. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, it is, um, we've got a, we've got a, we're looking at the state. The state budget was put together, and I talked to the lieutenant governor about this, I talked to the governor's staff, and we're looking at the economy overall, so the state budget was put together pretty much on a $65 a barrel, which makes no sense to me at all. I mean, I don't think businesses put together on $65 a barrel. If you did, I don't think you were thinking ahead very much, but maybe, maybe so. And I asked the lieutenant governor about that. He said, well, I didn't have anything to do with that. I said, well, it's putting all of us in a bind because I, every day, every morning I get up and I see what's going on with West Texas crew for Brent. Every day I get up. Except I can't tell you what it is this morning, but I guess it's 37 or 38 or something. Well, and depending on what, who you look to or who you ask, the state budget is somewhere between 14 and 25% of its, it's some related to oil and gas and all the, all the industries that are associated with it. So we clearly are paying attention to that. It has my attention, I can tell you that, because we're just looking at different options. And I'm looking down the road two or three years. Now, so far, we've not seen the direct impact of the layoffs that we've had. That's been at a different level. A lot of that's been in the oil, oil fields, and I know we're getting into management here locally, but in terms of big layoffs, we haven't seen that. What impacts us more than anything else is um, property values. When property values start going down, if we're getting the 38, 39, 38 percent of our money from uh, taxpayers, then when that that's assessed value. So when that goes down, that gets our attention. So it's a, uh, um, and I know uh, John, when you came to the board, and John's been very articulate with the board. And, in case you're wondering, I haven't forgotten what you said there that day about us being prepared. We are prepared for this. We're AAA rated. 
we are AAA rated, which is uh, for community college, there's nobody else that does any higher rating than us. And that, we have some flexibility, but we make a promise, again, and we're gonna keep that promise. We will, we're very efficient in what we do. I, I, we just, uh, again, I'm a taxpayer, so I take a look at everything we do. I pay special attention to it. I live here, my son lives here, my brother lives here. I've got other family that live here in the community. Plus, um, I see people I know when I go to the store all the time, so I, I want you to know that we're paying really close attention to what's going on and the impact in the community. I want you to feel like that it's your, it's your college. It is, it's your college. So let me, let me talk to you about the, some of the challenges that we're facing. So here's what happens when the economy starts slipping a little bit. Our enrollments actually go up. And so what I think is going to happen, this is what happened from 2008 to 2014 during the recession period, we actually doubled in uh, enrollment during that period. So the money doesn't keep up with that. And if it helps you to think anything, what, the way we operate is we have about $4,000 for each student. So if we got 80,000 students, we have 320, uh, or multiply 85 times four, that's the way that works, something, something like that. <coughs> So what I see probably happening, the reason I think our enrollments went up during the spring is because the economy started to slip a little bit. So we're seeing some of the results. I, I will know a little bit more this fall. This is a nice problem to have. We can deal with that problem. We, we, have, we offer 12,000 sections a semester, 12,000. I mean, we are huge. So the average class size is 23. Now, keep in mind that we're a community college and some of that, many of our classes are workforce, so that's a reason, if you're wondering why we don't do 30 or 35, we do in English and history and philosophy and some of the, what I'll call transfer liberal arts. The workforce programs are limited, sometimes by accreditation agencies or certification or credentialing agencies. Some are by, like in welding, we don't want too many people in there, we'll have welding stations of 14, 15, something like that. So we're taking a look at that. What I think is our enrollments are going to go up and the money is not going to follow it until later. And again, we can deal with that. That's a nice problem to have. We, in the bond, just so you'll know uh, where we are with that, we are paying very close attention. And we've, we've changed some of the projects, we've delayed some of the projects, and we're slowing the, the bond construction down a little bit. The one area that we're not slowing down very much is in our workforce. We still think that the workforce needs it there. So we have um, four advanced technology, what we're calling uh, workforce training centers, and they'll be some of the best in the country because we've been traveling to see. We, these workforce jobs, and we've really been focused on this. Students that want to transfer, more power to you. And, uh, but we also would like for students to stay here because there's a need for skilled, uh, a skilled workforce. And so we have computer information technology facility over in the site fair in Newman that we'll, we're working on. We actually bought an old oil, uh, it was a spec building, not old, it was a brand new spec building that they moved out of. So we're offering over there uh, Oracle, Cisco, uh, Microsoft, there's about 14 IT programs. It's over there off of uh, 10 and Beltway 8. And it's a really, it's located in a really neat place over there. And our, what we do is we take a look at every program we create, we see what the job market looks like. Actually, um, since she's here, Linda Head is our Associate Vice Chancellor for Workforce, and that's her job to make sure that every program we have, uh, we have graduates, there are jobs at the end of it, and there are livable wages at the end of it. So we've been, we've been focusing on oil and, uh, uh, let me talk about the centers and I'll come back and talk about the clusters. So we have a HVAC building going up at uh, North Harris because of all the big buildings in the Houston area, somebody needs to run those, and that's, that's high, a much higher tech. That, that HVAC refrigeration is different from maybe what you're used to, the guy that comes and works on your air conditioner at home. These are people that, uh, these are young people who are not young people, that uh, students that come through our program, it's a sophisticated program. You need to learn how to read those, those, uh, uh, you call those things, those controls, and yes. all the pieces that goes with that to manage those big buildings. And um, let's see, we have process technology facility going up uh, over near the chemical area, over all the way over in Atascocita, if you want to know how big our system is. 
we're all the way over there. We have another center going up in East Aldine in the Hispanic area. What's the other work? Oh, the track driving institute. You may not think about those, but track driving is a, uh, those are nice jobs. They need training. And when when oil was rolling, and we think, and I mean, whether it goes back up to, and you're reading the same thing I am, where it's, we still think it's going to creep up. Now, it may not, it's not going to get where it was, we don't think. If it gets up in the 50s or so, anyway, there's a big need for truck driving and logistics training, which comes with the truck driving. So we have a truck driving program over at North Harris also, and I'm missing one. Oh, we're having an expansion out here with welding and machining at, um, at Conroe. I was out at the center Conroe Center today. And then we have an oil and gas facility that we have a plan for Tom Ball. We're actually in the process of uh, a rig that's been donated to us, a working rig. Now, we started that process when oil was at $100. So in the meantime, we are leasing uh, I, this is just one of those projects that if oil stays low, we're not, there's just a couple of projects we've not, not been forward with on the bond. I don't, I haven't felt obligated. I don't think our board has either to spend every dollar we get a bond. If we don't need it, we don't need it. So we are leasing though from Baker Hughes. There still is training out there. There's a need for training in the oil and gas industry in places and as, as the rig count goes back up. And I, I just, it was 1600 and I think the last time I saw it was like 360 or 370 and it's, whenever supply and demand catches up, it's kind of, it's capitalism. So we, we think that some of those rigs are going to come back up. They still need trainers, which is, they come to us, by the way. We do that. When we train people. We develop some of the curriculum for, for the oil and gas rig training. You may be surprised at all the things that we do. So, um, I think that, um, as we look ahead, some of the big challenges we have, um, clearly the preparation that we're seeing from students in high school is a major challenge for us. Now, it's getting better, but we have somewhere between 30 and 35 percent of our students that enter each fall that are not ready in reading, writing, and math, all three of those subjects. Uh, not, it could be uh, one, one of those. Math seems to be our greatest problem. So we work very closely with the ISDs. And there is a gap between the expectations for high school graduation. You can graduate from high school and not be prepared for college. And that gap has been there ever since I've been in this business. I, I if you would ask me do I think that the way it should be, I would agree with you. I think that, but um, I, I was at, when I testified last week, the commissioner for public schools up there, and then the commissioner for higher ed, they know there's a gap there. But I, I'll have to tell you, in the community, when the, the ISDs at times, and I'm not talking about any particular ISD, I'm just talking about across the state, every time they talk about raising the standards, graduate from high school, some of the parents comply. They want their students through high school. Well, what's happening in many systems, just like so you know, and even in our region, is that uh, up to 50% of the kindergartners that start kindergarten are not ready for kindergarten. That means they can't read. Nobody taught them their ABCs or their colors or, I mean, to me, this all starts at home. It starts at home. <clears throat> so, in the fourth grade, they finally read at the first grade level. In the seventh, they're fourth, so ninth, they're at the seventh, and when they graduate, they're reading at the ninth grade level. Maybe the 10th. That's not college ready. That's why you see so many students go into developmental study. Now, the other part of that is we have a lot of people that graduated from high school some time ago. They go to work, they figure out that's not going to fly. And that's, you know, they, they go to work for the airport or something else. And all that's honorable and everything, but they want to move up, so they need to come back. So they're not, they haven't taken a math class in a while or, or they haven't read or taken an English class. So they have to go back into developmental studies. So that's, why we have so many of our students in developmental studies. Uh, I don't know, I don't have an answer for that. That gap needs to be closed to me. That, that would be helpful. And let me tell you, tell you one or two things that we're doing with a couple of the ISDs. We, uh, uh, CyFair in particular, we have embedded developmental studies courses in the high school. They have helped us with that. Conroe is coming up next. We do it with Willis. We're in the early stages of Conroe, but 
I think that's where it should be. I think that the high schools should be offering those development studies classes wherever they can. They should be ready for college level work when they get out. Now, we have to work with them. I think we need to work, and we've been meeting with the faculty. We've been doing that for some time, working with the faculty there, and are having our faculty work with them and go, okay, let's talk about your expectations when they graduate, and we'll talk about our expectations when they come in. And uh, we're not making up the test, we're giving a standardized test. We actually, just so you'll know, I just want you to know what's going on here, the state mandated that we have to give certain tests. The tests that they're giving uh, have lower standards than what we were giving before. We had our own test. And so, in my mind, which is why we have such a good reputation, you, you may be surprised to know that 80% of the students, uh, freshmen and sophomore in the state, actually attend community colleges, 80% of them. And community colleges are the largest single sector of higher ed in the state. 80% of the students that are graduating from a four-year school now in the state of Texas actually have community college hours. So we're seeing a lot of, uh, I mean, across the state, we're seeing the growth of community college. But that quality issue is a big one for me. It is a major one for me. I don't, if you're coming through on the academic side and you're transferring to SAM or A&M or UT, uh, Pick one, TSU, I don't care, you need to be prepared. We, I expect our faculty to really push them in the right way. Workforce, I feel the same way when they come to work. Um, we really press the quality issue when you see our facilities and how clean they are. And uh, we don't have, have to have the cutting edge of everything, but I don't want our students to come out of school and have never seen a standard piece of equipment. So we, we work with business and industry to make sure that we have the right uh, curriculum, the technical part, and then the, what I'm going to call the social skills that go with that. We talk, we have advisory committees that we meet with, business and industry, where they tell us, here's what we expect, not only on the technical side, but on the behavioral side. We, we talk to our students a lot about showing up on time. I mean, tattoos we can live with, but don't put them in places like on your forehead or something where people can see you, like some of the stuff we've seen, and all of you know what I'm talking about, you, you either deal with it with your kids or your own grandkids. And we we talk to them about how to, how to handle conflict resolution. So we've got advisory committees for uh, manufacturing, you know, what oil and gas. We have uh, uh, medical and we have computer information systems. So those are a big program. Our clusters in general, what we work on in the workforce, of course, are oil and gas. We work on, um, uh, we are the largest trainer, or the leading trainer of EMTs and police officers around. We have uh, computer information technology and visual communications. The healthcare, all the healthcare program, we're, we're, we're the leading trainer. It's hard to find. When you go into one of the nurses' offices or in the hospitals, you're gonna find our nurses all over the place, all over the place. And I'm missing one. What's the other one? STEM business. Sorry. Yeah. Professional services. Profession services and business and accounting. So that's what we really zero in on. So what we try to do though is take a look at the market. We try to see what's out there, what's going to be out there, what the salary's going to be, and make sure that our students are getting what they need. I, I'm, I'm with you. I have the same issues you do. I want to make sure that when our children went through college, unfortunately for us, they're all through and they're all decent citizens on most days, um, that they have jobs and they're taxpayers. That's what we want is productive taxpayers and good citizens and good people, good individuals who care about the community and want to contribute to the community. Well, one thing we're looking at, Bill sent me a note. Um, we have been pressing, we asked for it last time, we talked to the, talked to the Lieutenant Governor and talked to several of our state senators Got a meeting tomorrow with uh, Paul Bettencourt. We've been pushing for community colleges to have more access to uh, uh, bachelor's degrees in workforce areas. One is a Bachelor of Applied Technology. We would like for our workforce students to have access to that because the universities don't do it. If you show me a university that would do it, we would partner with them and send them. So, like in engineering technology, when the oil business was running, you could make $100,000 in your second year over that. The problem is, if you want to come back, if they want to move you up, and I talked to a, a, a young man today that I was going to tell you about who said he would like to get a bachelor's degree because he had been blocked moving up in his career because he had a machining 
uh, certificate, but you wouldn't have been involved. But when you go talk to a university, they tell you, well, you've got to start all over again. You need a business degree, and all those classes that you took in that workforce don't count. When that's exactly who you want. That person actually knows what's going on on the floor, and you want to move them up into management. So we want a Bachelor of Applied Technology. And there's a nursing shortage. There continues to be a nursing shortage, and we can't get past well, we can't get past some of our legislators, and we can't get past some of the regulatory agencies. So we're we have a full court press on everybody right now. We do. We're talking to the lieutenant governor, who thinks it's all a good idea. We can do it for about ten thousand dollars because we charge the same thing we would for the community college. Just so you know, um, our you can go to school for us at uh, well for one year. It's about sixteen hundred dollars. For tuition fees and for tuition and fee books are about the same price, so it's about three thousand dollars for tuition fees and books. I'm telling you, as a parent, who three of ours went to a pro uh, public schools and the other one went to a private school, the so for three thousand dollars a year, and then it's eighteen or those of you who have you know it's eighteen to twenty thousand to go to a public school. So that's why we're pushing some of the things that we're pushing to try to be more efficient. When I heard the governor, when Governor Perry said, well, we ought to be offering $10,000 degrees, I, I, I agree with it. I totally agree with it. But I, what we're looking for, though, is we're not interested in competing with the universities. We have partnerships, and I'm not interested in offering English degrees and history and all that. We have a couple of degrees targeted that we want to help our students who, so that stay here and they can move up and have career opportunities and make really good money in the workforce. Bill, um, what was the other article? So that, that um, you sent me the article on the development studies, which, uh, or we had talked about that before. Is that you that you, that you that sent me that? Yeah. Right, okay, yeah, okay. Um, and the other one was some other articles about the 10% of what's happening with the universities, how they're charging. Yes, I think they're raising their tuition and fees more than makes sense to. I read the article, I read the same article you did, I saw a preview, it raised theirs 567% over a period of time. Well, inflation is not 567%, as a matter of fact, it's been pretty flat. It does, you know, what happens is um, the state, I mean, the other part of this, the state is pushing some of the costs down to us, and then in the universities in particular, so the state used to regulate the tuition and fees, and then they deregulated it, and now they deregulated it the way the universities act. They just raise their costs whenever they feel like it. And so now it's gotten out of hand, so they may take, a, take that back over. I mean, the good news for us is, and I tell my university friends this, keep raising your tuition and fees. It helps us every time you do that. The students are looking at us. Um, our students are quite successful. You actually have a better chance of graduating from a four-year school if you start at the community college, and, which just makes sense if you think about it. And uh, if you get all the nonsense out of your system and you, you learn how to go to school, we're really pushing a dual prep. We, are the, we have 11,700 students in dual prep. And if you're a parent and your child is not in dual prep, I think, just think you're missing out on something. I used to send letters out to parents saying, I, I, you need to do this. We saved about $100,000 because they took the credits. At, uh, we took credits at UT, at Sam, where my son ended up going, uh, um, at UT, two of ours went to UT, and the other one went to the University of Miami. And uh, they took the credits. And one was a private school, the other was public, but that's what you need to do, but it helps them get ready for college. The success rates are almost 15% different, by the way. If you go, if you put your child in dual credit, that's how high the difference is, whether, uh, if they go in dual credit, that's how, that's how much difference there is. So it's worth your time and effort. And for us, in my mind, anyway, it helps them to become more confident about doing college work because they're going to be pressed to do to the credit. Um, I'm make sure I'm covering everything I need to cover. I had a list of, uh, hold on a minute, let me take a look at my list. I think, I think what's, what's important is what's going on with the community college relative to being preps for uh, and going on uh, to AM or wherever. I mean, it just, sure. the guy, guy gave me a day, he sent his son to Longstar from here, they could pull load to see if he could do it before he spend all that money on it. 
I, I, I'm just telling you as a parent, and the message, I cannot make this clear enough to everybody because we saw it ourselves. Um, you will save yourself so much money. That's part of it. But the other part is not every, uh, I mean, we, we've seen a little bit of everything in our family. So my son went to, what I mean, school to go to? Why? He's very successful, Brian. He's very successful. Yeah. <laughs> well, he'll, he'll tell you, he is, uh, so some that are ready to go off, and uh, some that are ready to go off, and some that need maturity, and that need to stay at home for a while, and get the confidence level, because I know how they act, you know, around their friends and everything. Socialization yes. relative to a lot of kids that you were in high school with when you arrived. Yes. Because they're not going to be in conversation. And, and you're also in your set. Right. So it's a... Uh, well, we have no monster classes. The larger class we have, we may have a class with, usually our largest classes are 35, sometimes 40, but that's really pushing it. But we don't have big uh, auditorium classes. We just don't do that. Because that defeats the purpose of the community college. And, and I've had those monster classes when I was in school. We, we're really pushing, uh, we use a lot of adjuncts. We're trying to balance that out a little bit uh, over a seven year period, but um, our college is one of the high performing community colleges really in the state and really in the country. So we have some challenges. Clearly we have challenges. Uh, the developmental this part, we have students that hang around too long. Dr. Trowbridge and I were at conferences past weekend and our students, some of them are hanging around a lot longer. I've already been boring in on that to see why, what it is that we're doing while we're not moving them on. And we're trying to set aside scholarship money wherever we can to help some of the students with financial. I'm not, I'm not counting on the federal government or anybody else. I'm just counting on money that we have to help them wherever we can. Because the sooner they get out and start making money or uh, whether they go on or go into the workforce, they're, they become taxpayers and good citizens. So that's what we're trying to help them do. So, um, we're in good shape. We're going to be in good shape. Uh, we're going to keep ourselves in good shape. We work, I mean, the administration works very closely with our board. Uh, Dr. Trowbridge can comment on that if you would like. And um, that's not if you would like. You, you, gotta, you all know him. He's going to say whatever he wants to say. But uh, I think I would, I would like you to talk to him a little bit about the way the board looks at things. But we're, one thing I've appreciated about uh, John and Bill and Julie is, um, if you have a question, just ask me. It's your school. I don't mind sharing that information at all. I am very, we run the college. You're, you're not, I don't think you're ever going to see us in the paper. If it is, it'll be something, somebody getting fired for doing something wrong. But I'm just telling you, the way we operate, we, we have put the administration and the board separate from the selection on the, our architects and our contractors and all of that. We, we let other people do that. We have a point system. It's clear. You can see it there whenever you want to. It's open record. So I'm very upfront and very honest and very transparent about the whole thing. I think that's the way our culture is. Um, I need to be able to go to the store and be able to talk to you without, without trying to hide when I see you. I have to not want to do that. And um, I'm, I want our students to be proud. And I want the community to be proud of us because you've got something to be proud of. I tell you, you're not going to find a better community college. You will not find a better community college anywhere. And you can travel all over you. And I'm very appreciative of the community support that we have. But I think the, the burden on us is to make sure you have all the information. And it, I, I'm okay if we disagree. I, I need to hear the other side of this because, you know, I'm surrounded by people that. Sometimes I, I realize they're telling me sometimes what they think I want to hear. That's not what I need. I need input. So. I'd be glad to answer questions that you have or things I need to talk about. Right. See, um, I, I'm concerned that the whole education, higher education model is a little bit uh, bankrupt. That may be too strong a word, but we have all these kids coming out of four years all these expectations of employment, not the expectations may not be realistic, but they have expectations of, of employment. Um, with the cost of colleges, uh, lots of them, maybe the vast majority of them have C 
We did a debt that they came in on with, uh, under this expectation of you know, the piece of employment coming out of college. And, and the employment isn't, isn't materialized. Uh, and part of that's the economy, but part of that is the, the way uh, they're being trained in college and the way employers are, or, or what the expectations are of employers of what someone coming out of college would do. And they're not, they're, those aren't being matched. I think, I think what your model is, is to try to solve that second problem. You can't do anything about the economy. You can certainly, you can attach it to some both of the both You can make sure people coming out of the college are more matched to what the market's looking for. And by reducing the cost of the education, you're not putting these kids starting out with uh, you know, this huge debt over, uh, over their heads. What, what is wrong with creating a competitive situation your model and, and the, the established four year school models. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And I told the Lieutenant Governor that. I told a couple of our senators that to me this is educational capitalism. So if we can produce, and we'll show you that we can produce at uh, half the rate or about half the rate or less than that at the universities, then let us try that and see. You can sunset the programs if that's what you want to do. And I mean, what Part of what you're dealing with is you're dealing with a lot of issues, which is why this group is formed, is kind of moving against the historical, well, we're doing it because we always did it that way. And I, by the way, I went through history, I mean, I went through college with, I have a BA, an MA, and a PhD in history. And not one person ever sat down and said, what do you think you're going to do with that at the end of it? And so, and somewhere along the way, I decided that I really didn't want to teach all the time. And so I ended up, I am very fortunate, and I use all the skills I have, but not one person sat down with me and said, do you know what kind of money you're gonna make or what the job market is like? Uh, so we're trying to get away from that. I will tell you that our workforce program, we have really zeroed in on the end product, what's out there for you. We have some of the publications that some of you may get where we tell you what the range is, the salary, what you can expect. And we work very closely with the employers to make sure that there are jobs out there. It, and we also have job placement people, and we have advisors assigned to help the students. The, the model, though, I, I, I agree with you. And so what's happening is, and I, I mean, there's an argument being made for liberal arts or whatever it is, whatever it is you want to work on, but if it's your child, okay, I'll just take a degree in sociology. Are there jobs out there? Yeah, there are, but, or history? So if you get a BA in history, like I did, you're, once you get there, then if you think people are gonna come running to you, it doesn't work that way. So you either go on and get an MA, or maybe you go to work at an entry level, or you think about going to law school, which and I did all of those. But I, but I decided at that time the easy way was just to go get a master's degree. And so I had the same decision to make after I got a master's degree, then I went and got a PhD, then I got a job along the way, but I, I the, the schools, um, the schools that we're seeing the most progress with, uh, have much more of a business approach and accountability approach than than some. And there's schools that do a better job of that. That are really working with employers and trying to get a feel for what the where the economy is going to be, so that we can get people placed in the right in the right job. So, I'm not sure I answered your question, but I agree with you that the model. Uh, many of the colleges are not thinking about the right model and what the end product is. It's about getting students in and keeping people employed and the dollars that go with that. Uh, we were talking to Brian beforehand. A lot of the colleges are run by people that came up through academics. We are too, but some have more of a business sense than others. I mean, I, one nice thing about the community college, I think, living here in the middle of it all, and actually just my interest, um, I, I I'm, I'm a liberal arts guy, so I think having an education, a well-rounded education, is important. And all the stuff you talked about, yes, I know about all that, but that's really for something <laughs> which you and I are going to write a book and we can talk about that, but that's not going to put money on the table for us like that. So, okay. Yes, sir? Yeah, a couple of questions. One is, given your expertise in business, why is UT raising rates again? I mean, what is it? 
it requires them to regularly raise tuition and fees. The yeah. short answer. Because they can. Because well, nobody's talking. What is it in the budget that generates the need? There's none. That's just it. UT has. Well, I'm not. I'm not picking on any UT or A&M. UT and A&M are two of the wealthiest colleges. Yeah, right. right. So. Um, what are the costs in the budget to drive these increases? There's not right now. Actually, uh, I mean, utilities. Uh, the state pushes some dollars down to us. I mean, they. I mean, to be fair about this, the state has been reducing the allocation to us. So the colleges did have to move up tuition to make up for what the state did. The state just said, "That's you take care of that." But as I mentioned, if you read that article, and Bill Hunter would send it to anybody else or not, but when you're talking about what where tuition is, and then they're raising the rates at some ridiculous prices. So they're always competing for high priced faculty. They want the latest, greatest buildings, even though the state finances a lot of that. By the way, our buildings are financed locally. That's you, you pay for the buildings. That's the difference in the university. So that there is no logic to that. The senators are finally catching on to this. Some of our legislators are finally catching on to this that you can't be doing that. You've got to justify it. If it's justified, I think most of us would, I mean, if you've got older buildings and there's some, something going on there, then maybe you could justify that, but I, it's because they can. There's nobody telling them that they can't, so. Well, in your budget, what are the long poles in the tank? I mean, what's your overhead for the workforce, your payroll? Do you have any entitlements in your budget for the exact to the state? And what's your debt service as a percentage of your annual budget? Our uh, debt service, our tax rate is 10.79. Our debt service, I want to say, is 3.1 cents, something like that, of that, of that percentage, of that, of those, of that cent. So, so the pie chart, right. you see the slice, how much right. is debt service? It would be about 30% of what the tax, something like that, about 30% of what the taxes are. Our budget's 350, say 350 for argument's sake. So. I just want to make sure I understand. Right. Because you're saying the tax rate. Is that your budget? No, our tax, okay. Our budget is what three. What percentage is it of the budget? Your debt service. And then you're paying for Okay. So, of our budget, we're paying about 100 million a year, something like that, off of on our debt service. So. Uh, well. Let me, let me restate that. We're paying about 70 right now. It's going to go up to 100 million in probably year two of our bond so that we can pay those off. And we've been accelerating our bond payments. So we're refinancing them wherever we could to get lower rates. So, I'm not sure I understood. Did you say your annual budget is like 334? 350, right. 350 million. Right. So what's your uh, overhead for payroll and then facilities, for example? Normally, our budget. I'll have to give you a breakdown over. I, I'm glad to send you whatever you need. It's about 76 or 77 percent of our over of our dollars are going to the items that you just mentioned to pay for. All. That's that's pretty standard. What we try to do is keep our uh, we've got formulas that we use over what percentage should be administrative and what percentage should be in payroll so that we can manage our money. When you say entitlements, like it's pushed to the state. Yeah. So you don't have anything that grows. No, we do not. We do not. Yeah, the state. Uh, in our case, we have uh, for public schools, we have two options. One is the Texas retirement plan. The other is the optional retirement. So you, where you manage your own money, the state matches them. Um, that's part of your salary. Where. Uh, the school matches like 6% and the state puts in another 6%, something something like that. It's about 12 or 13% of your salary, depending on when you started. So if you're on optional retirement like I am, my wife is on TRS, so that's a different. She puts 6% and the state puts that up and it goes into the state fund. Oh. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Are these, uh, are these, uh, is there any way that you can see that 25% are more likely to complete and go on. Uh, I'm not 
Space issues are going to be about seven or eight years from now when we see it depends on what happens with the economy and what happens with all those developments around 99. That our big, I mean, we have growth everywhere. Um, when we look at Conroe, what's going on in Willis, but that we can pretty much handle that with the space that we have right now. But when we look out at Site Fair and what's being planned out there, you know, they've got two 6A high schools coming in out there, and um, it's it's we're meeting with some of the developers who are telling us what, how land is being sold out there and what who is being sold to you know, developers or communities. And so when I look at a place like Bridgeland where they build an entire community, that's the way they started out, not a subdivision. But Bill, the site fair is our, I, I think, our model right now. I was told yesterday that we have about 900 students of theirs enrolled in developmental studies. Uh, I mean, they're paying for it. We're helping them with the instruction so that they can get ready for college, which I think is the best model. I, I think that's the model. Willis is doing the same thing. Now, again, we need to, Humboldt is doing a little bit. In Conroe, we've just been in discussions with them about that. So, and Don Stockton and I talk, but I think that's important that Conroe do the same thing. But that's, we don't pay for that, they do. I mean, they, they need, me, they need to be paying for getting their students ready to go to college. So um, you're right, though. Over an extended period of time, we're going to have a space issue if something's not done about some of this. Okay. Yes, ma'am. May I have the floor now? I've been in education for over four years. I teach at Lone Star. I teach the remedial. And, oh, I'm just kidding. I, I teach. I'm out. I need the mind. I teach at Lone Star. I taught in public education for many years. I was a department chair of reading and writing. And I'm going to be very political correct, politically correct right now. When I taught, last time I taught in public school, as department chair, I had to break down everything. How many whites passed the practice tax test, which it was in? How many blacks and how many Hispanics? How many Orientals? And we had to lower state, the state lowered standards because we wanted everybody to be able to pass the state test. So don't even get me started there. Now I'm at Lone Star, I teach the remedials. Most of the people who teach the remedials who teach with me are adjunct. We have taught in the public school, we know what was expected in the public school, we know how they left, and we know what's expected for, for college. And I will tell you, the developmental classes are extremely important. I get students sometimes from, you know, other countries who are really trying hard. I get older people who are coming back from, to school, like he said, people who are in the workforce and they're not making it. But, you know, they can't pass the test to, to get into the higher classes. And I'm, I want to tell you, I have students come back, I see them in the hallway, they're saying, thank you for giving me the basics because I would not have made it in the 1301, which is the first freshman class, if you had not taught the basics. And if we had not gone over a lot of things that are expected, I have students drop out. 
After about six weeks of school, they say, I can't do it. Now, if they can't do developmental, they, they're not going to make it through the other. I have students I send to counseling. My counselors know who I am because I send my students with issues to them. I, we do many things at developmental. I have them look up their jobs. What do you want to do? Well, let's look it up. Let's see what you're going to make. Let's see what you're going to need. Now, is this what you really want to do after you look at this? But we do all the basics. I teach the English. We do reading, writing, things they did not, don't ask me why. I will tell you, texting has a lot to do with it because they want to write like they text. They don't get a lot of formal writing in high school in certain cases because once that state test is over, it's okay. It's, they're free to go and roam or whatever. And that's the kind of students I get. I had a student one year, one summer session, who had to have my developmental class because he had a scholarship to prayer review, but he had to pass my class. He didn't show up, didn't turn in his work, came to my class and said, I'm sorry, son, I just dropped you from my class. He said, can you come outside and talk to my mommy? I said, no, I cannot talk to your mommy. You are in college now. Well, I can't get my scholarship. I said, I'm sorry because we teach respect, we teach you, we try to teach you what you need to go on. So, that's my spill. I can say a lot more of it. One, uh, let me go back to the more I, so let me go back and answer the other question because I did the math while I was here. So we take in about 140 million a year in taxes because of our tax rate. Of that, about a third goes to debt service. So that's 42 to 45 million, something like that, goes to debt service. Does that sound? Yeah. Does that answer your question? No, I, I, okay. Any other issues or questions? I need to, yes, ma'am. Uh, you had mentioned that you weren't moving forward on the bond on certain things, but the workforce. You know, you definitely uh, saw the value in moving that. So, what are you not moving forward on? Well, we're moving slowly on some. Uh, I I actually delayed, or well, I told them I delayed it. I probably killed the uh, academic building in North Harris because they've actually lost enrollment. So we were planning. I used to be the president of North Harris, and we had double-digit growth for a number of years. So when I came up. The enrollment, when I came up with being the chancellor almost two years ago, the enrollments have been dropping. And we don't need to build a building there if the enrollments are dropping. We, we just don't. So all the projections, and, and we use about, we, when we, we hire companies to do this, and we'll have about 10 different estimates, and we usually take the ones in the middle. I mean, the chamber says one thing, because they're always overly optimistic, and then we do businesses, and they're somewhere in between. And things like that. So that's, we, we delayed on that one. We actually had some discussions this morning about slowing some of the projects down for several months so that we can see what happens with um, oil prices because if oil doesn't come back up then, we have, I think, 2.7 million budgeted, 1.7 million for next year, next year's budget, and then it moves up to 3.7 and 3.7 and 3.2 million for operating costs for those new facilities. But if we don't have the, if water prices stay down, we don't have the money from the state, and we don't have the student growth, I, I told the group today that if we don't have big growth, then we're going to slow those projects down even more until we have the growth. We're not, we already had a growth problem, but we don't need to add to our money issues. We're in great shape, but we're going to that way. So the academic building over there, we slowed the project down in East Aldine, which was a center that we had down there. We moved that back about six months. We moved the project back in Tascosita, which I have some doubts about because that's for process technology, but because the chemical companies are still, they're still looking for workers over there, but um, I want us to be careful and not get ourselves overextended here. So um, those are the three three projects that we slowed down. I will tell you the oil rig, uh, that one too. We're sitting on that one right now. 